Okay, thanks, Sean, and thanks to North Branch Nature Center for pulling this together. I actually cannot see any of you. I can't even see myself. I'm looking at my program for you. Um, and I have to say, this is all new to me. It's a little odd, not very natural to be talking about sparrows with all of us looking into our glowing screens, but let's, let's see what we can do. Let's uh, get started here. And actually, I think that I can make this simple for all of you and help you identify not only sparrows, but any bird that you see. So you're out in the field, you're birding, you see a bird. You can identify that bird as either big brown bird, little brown bird, or other. And so there you have it. We have a system here and you see one of these birds and you know you've got a little brown bird. So I guess we're done. Can we um, now go on to our uh, Google Meet beer hangout or something? Uh, but I suspect not. You've all come here for sparrows. And before we really get started, I should uh, share with you some ground rules and kind of how we want to go about things this evening. And of course, the first ground rule is the overused COVID-19 joke. You have to actually be careful when you are social distancing from sparrows because their masks don't fit very well. You don't get a good seal, I'm told. Um, but what I want to begin with is to tell you what this talk is not about. And it is not about giving you the information to identify sparrows at species level. You know, I don't want to give you rote details about how to separate this sparrow from that sparrow. It's not about memorizing anything tonight. Uh, all of this stuff is basically available in most good field guides. I want to just kind of bring it into focus for you. What I want instead is to sort of give you a sense of how to be with these birds how to just sort of set yourself with them and how to look at them because like learning to look at them, the approach to looking at them is sort of essential uh, in, in particular to sparrows. Um, and I also want you to enjoy yourselves uh, among sparrows. I don't want you to stress out among sparrows. Here's your typical, uh, you know, there are countless photos of bird watchers looking at birds. We are not looking at a sparrow there. We're looking up in the trees although there are some sparrows that will land up in trees. I think we were in Northern Vermont looking at warblers, uh, but I kind of want you to relax really. I kind of want you to have this kind of posture when you're thinking about sparrows. I don't want you to stress out about this. And actually uh, Ruth down there, uh, lower left, you will be alone a lot. And actually, to be honest, it's a great way to kind of hang out with sparrows and spend time with them. So what is a sparrow? Where do we begin? Let's get some of the taxonomy out of the way. They are in a family called the Passerellidae. These are the American sparrows. These are new world sparrows. There are more than little brown birds in this family. Juncos are included in this family. You know, conical bills, seed eating birds. Toeys are in this family. Not an Eastern toe, it's got spots on the wing. It's a spotted toey. I photographed that in New Mexico. Uh, that's an Oregon junco, by the way. And, um, you know, our sparrows, the sparrows, the little brown birds that we, we tend to see. Um, what makes a sparrow a sparrow? Well, you kind of know them when you see them. They do have conical bills. They're brownish somewhere. They tend to have streaky backs. They can be clean or streaky below. It's basically, you know, your little brown bird. You know it when you see it. Now, unfortunately, there are always exceptions when it comes to birds, thank, thank goodness. And this is a sparrow, this is a lovely bird. This is black chin sparrow that I photographed in the Southwest. Uh, you know, there are some sooty colored sparrows, but nothing this wonderfully gray and brown with that honker of an orange bill. Uh, not a sparrow that we're going to see in the Northeast, unless it's way out of range. Where do we find them? Well, you know, anywhere. 
You know, they tend not to be woodland birds. Although, if you go north and west, particularly across Canada, you begin to realize how chipping sparrow, which is a bird of openings, including forest openings, and white crown sparrow are in fact forest birds. White crown sparrow is widespread across forests of Canada. And you really, we don't see them. It's a migrant here in the Northeast. They don't breed here, they breed north of us. But you realize that yes, indeed, there are sparrows of our of forests, uh, usually much farther north. We tend to see sparrows in open country. And kind of what are the, what's their behavior? Well, you name it. They are just about everything and they are also spishable. You know, sparrows can be easy to see they can be cryptic and furtive and frustrating and impossible, but they are spishable and what I or pishable, if you will. And what I mean by that is they're inquisitive. And if you spish, if you're a birder and you know, sh -sh -sh -sh, will often elicit curiosity among birds. It's a scold or a warning call that gets the attention of birds. They want to see what's happening. Sparrows will pop up and they will give you a look as you try to look at them. So I'm gonna encourage you to spish these birds. You, you see a little brown bird and it disappears from you and I want you to work it, spish it responsibly. You know, not so much in the breeding season, but you're gonna do better with these birds if you can get good looks at them. And they, some of them are notorious for being hard to see and hard to decipher. So spish them. You know, do what you can to get good looks at them. Now, uh, here's a little brown bird crawling around in the lawn. Uh, sparrow, right? No, it's an imposter. And note that there will be imposters. There are classic sparrow imposters. And what gives this one away as an imposter is it's, you know, it's pencil point bill. That is not a conical sparrow bill. And this is in fact an American pipit. And its posture isn't, it's just, you know, it doesn't feel like a sparrow. Its posture is just not right. Its head is small. It's kind of lengthy. It's just the pipit, not a sparrow. Um, what about that one? Um, again, the bill gives it away is not a sparrow. This is, a, this is sort of an omnivorous bird. It's a fruit eater uh, and some seeds. But, you know, its back is clean. Yeah, it's streaky below and it's brown. It's an LBB. But there is no sparrow that we're going to see anyway that has a nice, clean, brown back like that. So this is a, um, this is a Swainson's thrush, and it is not a sparrow. And then this one, which, you know, I think um, is probably the bird that's not a sparrow that is most often confused by, you know, and called a sparrow by novices. If you look at that bill, yeah, it's kind of conical, but it's more of an ice cream cone bill. I mean, it's, it's more of a dagger. And this bird is heavily marked. There are sparrows that are marked like this, but uh, this one's out in the marsh and this is a female red-winged blackbird. And I get lots of new birders on birding trips who look out and see this streaky bird. Uh, and they think it's a sparrow, but Again, not a sparrow. Oh, there's my phone. I guess I shouldn't do that. That, that actually was a sparrow. <laughs> um, that was a fox sparrow is my ringtone. So again, not a sparrow. So what are we going to do in terms of a system for looking at sparrows? Well, it all begins with this bird. And this is really kind of a prologue to our system. And that is you must know this bird. This is Song Sparrow. And it is the quintessential classic sparrow. Like you look at this thing and it's the sparrowness of sparrowdom. It is a streaky brown bird with heavy streaking down the breast and down the sides all the way to the flanks. This heavy mark on the side of the throat called the lateral throat stripe, which we'll get to in a bit. It's brownish and streaky and gray and 
It's a sparrow. What can I tell you? It's a sparrow. So you really need to know Song Sparrow. It is around us now singing. It's, you know, they're singing on territory here and where I live in Montpelier, Vermont right now. So this is your reference bird. And oftentimes uh, when I'm teaching gall identification, for example, I tell birders, you can't know and you can't learn to identify four-year gulls, many of our common gull species and our rare gull species, until you know how to identify a first winter herring gull. You just can't. And it's the same thing here. You need to know song sparrow. And yes, it's among the most common and widespread birds in North America. It is variable in its plumage depending on location and its song, but you know, this is an opportunity if you are a novice birder, you will not easily learn and see other streaky sparrows until you know song sparrow. And that includes its song, which I don't know if you can hear that. Let me make that a little louder. Right, It begins with two or three introductory notes. followed by this, you know, mixture of trills and whistles. Like I say, they're singing now. If you're not hearing song sparrows, you're probably in the deep woods or on a mountain somewhere. That's its call note, one of its calls. That's another one, that sharper note. So learn song sparrow, get to know song sparrow. You will see other sparrows and not dismiss them as song sparrows once you know this bird. So like your first homework assignment, spend time with song sparrows now, you know, particularly if you're new to this, look at them and we're gonna learn in a bit how to look at them and what to look at uh, so that you will see this bird as more than just a streaky little brown bird. And if you already know this bird, you know, um, learn its call notes and spend time with younger birds this summer. Hatch year song sparrows don't look like this. They look different. They look more like another sparrow species. Um, if you are an advancing birder and you don't know what this sparrow does when it disappears into the shrubs, um, learn that kind of posture and movement. Song sparrows have longish tails, longer than other members of its uh, genus, Melospiza, here in the Northeast. And when I see these birds flopping away from me, I see a little brown bird, but their tails are so long that when it kind of flutters away, the tails kind of flop a little bit. And it's characteristic of song sparrow. You see it, you see this little brown bird and you go, oh yeah, I see that tail flop, that's a song sparrow. So um, even if you think you know song sparrow, spend more time with it, get to know it. And one thing I'm gonna have you do is look at their heads. And sort of the second part of the prologue here is that you really should learn feather morphology. I don't want you to learn it now. You know, I don't want you to worry about learning right now these feather groups. I just need you to know that you've got some time. If you've got some time, learn head markings on sparrows. Look, these are all distinct groups of feathers. And I, I kind of want you to know the names of them because it's nice to know the names of these feather groups but I want you to know the names of them more so because I want you to know they exist on most all birds, particularly songbirds. You know, these birds, um, you know, did evolve from a common ancestor and they, they share feather groupings. And this area here, this central crown stripe, is a very important mark in sparrow identifications. So is the lateral crown stripe. So is this area between the eye and the bill, the lores. This is an eye line. So know that there are feather groupings. This sparrow in particular is really nice for illustrating it because its head is so dramatic, so beautiful, so simple to decipher. Uh, this is lark sparrow. Unfortunately, it doesn't breed here. The closest these things breed, I think, is Ohio or maybe Pennsylvania now, but it's a Western sparrow actually. And, but just we're gonna go through some of these feather groups. We're gonna use them as we identify sparrows. So I just want you to look in the beginning of your field guide. Uh, Sibley is great for this. Know that these feather groups exist and learn them. 
learn their whereabouts on the bird. This one in particular, the mailer, which has had some confusion in its definition over the years, it is a, it is a patch of feathers that begin at the base of the lower mandible. And it is a different feather group than this lateral throat stripe. Sometimes this has in the past been called the mustachial stripe, um, confused with this black stripe. We'll see some of these, but just know that there are these feather groups and know that they will help you. So for example, if you're looking at these white crown sparrows, this is a central continent plains version of the sparrow, and this is a, um, or eastern version of the sparrow, and this is a western version of it, or I'm, I'm sorry, this is an eastern one, and that's a central continental uh, white crown sparrow. But know that there's a lateral crown stripe here. It's reduced because of the way this bird has got its feathers just back. These are slightly raised. But know that the lures are dark here and the lures are not dark there. So two different races of saw, two different races of white crown sparrow. And these head markings are going to help you in sparrow identification. Even on the streaky ones, you know, even on the ones that look not as nice and clean and well-defined as this one, the messy ones have the same feather groups. They, this one has a white mailer. This one I haven't defined. It's the mustachial stripe or the lower auricular stripe. An eye line. A little smudginess in the lores. Again, the supercilium or the eyebrow. This bird has a yellowish in its supercilium. This is sometimes called the supralaural area, the upper area above the lores. So know that when you're looking at a sparrow, a streaky sparrow with a messy head, it's not so messy. It's definable. And you're going to want to define these things if you want to identify streaky sparrows. Here is our quintessential sparrow, our song sparrow, again, with this lateral throat stripe a pale creamy mailer, the auriculars right here, kind of a messy lures, an eye line at the top of the auriculars, supercilium, lateral crown stripe, an ill-defined central crown stripe. So again, head markings definable on streaky sparrows. So, you know, homework assignment number two is going to be look at sparrow heads, you know, look at them in the field, look at them in your in your in your field guides and recognize that they are going to help you with identification we will get to this sparrow a little later if you feel good if you know that if you know um feather morphology head feather patterns um and you're an advancing birder you know know all your feather morphologies I'll, i may point some of them out on other sparrows or learn molt sequences, like knowing how birds change through the seasons um, can actually help you when you're trying to identify birds, knowing where it stands in its molt sequence. So just get a sense of this arrangement of feathers, particularly on sparrow heads, because you're going to look at the heads of sparrows a lot. So we've got, you know, you need to know song sparrow, you need to know uh, head markings. So how are we going to approach? We see a sparrow. How are we going to, what are we going to do? You, you know, you're going to say, okay, this is not a sparrow imposter. I've got a sense that this is a sparrow. And so I think, and there, there are other ways that birders go about this, but I think you should ask yourself, you should look at your sparrow and ask yourself, is it streaked or is it clean below? You know, is it streaky like a song sparrow? Or is it really unmarked? Okay. This sparrow is kind of an in-betweener. It's, it's fairly clean, but somewhat streaky. But you should ask yourself, is that sparrow streaky below? And then, if it's streaky below, you really need to be asking yourself, is it a song sparrow? Because, you know, chances are it will be a song sparrow. <laughs> um, I would probably say that here in Vermont now, if you're out birding, the average birder out now looking at birds sees a sparrow, my guess is, I don't know, I could be wrong with this, someone may disagree with me, you know, 65 to 75% of the time, it's going to be a song sparrow if it's a streaky sparrow, maybe more. So ask yourself, is it a song sparrow? And you're going to know because you're studying sp song sparrow as part of your homework. And if not, it's other, it's something else. Um, 
if the sparrow is clean below, then hey, it's not a song sparrow. Uh, so it is, although, you know, heck, give, give song sparrows a chance and they'll find a way not to be streaky below. That's how adapted and, you know, well distributed these birds are. But if it's not a song sparrow, then it's something else. So I tell people if they're starting with sparrows, ask yourself if it's streaked below or clean below. So here we go. Pretty obvious, streaked and clean. And once you do that, here in Vermont and actually um, across much of New England, I'm emitting some sparrows here. We'll get to them in a sec. If you've got a, seek a streaky sparrow this time of year here in Vermont and really across much of the Northeast, and I know some of you are saying, wait a minute, I know some exceptions here. But if you've got a streaky sparrow, it is one of four species. Fox sparrow is a migrant, and it is, for the large part, in large part, already moved through our area. So if you've got a street sparrow, you've got four options. If you've got a clean sparrow, you've got more options, but, you know, American tree sparrows are out of here. They are a northern breeding sparrow. White crown sparrows will be coming through. They're probably coming through now, and they, they migrate through in May, but they breed north of us. They are not a breeding sparrow. So, again, your choices, it's not like you need to go plowing through every sparrow in your field guide. Depending on where you are, if you judge to have, you are judging whether to have a streaked or a clean sparrow, you, you've narrowed down your choices tremendously. Now, of course, there are other sparrows. And my sort of main example there the, the, on my intro slide was swamp sparrow. And it is kind of an in-betweener. Um, and we'll look at swamp sparrows. I consider it a clean sparrow. It happens to be in a genus with these two streaky sparrows. Young swamp sparrows are streaky, but we're not seeing young swamp sparrows now. They're all adults that we're seeing. So, and all of these are sparrows that have showed up here in our, my home state of Vermont, which you are unlikely to see, frankly. So we're looking at, right now we're looking at four streaky sparrows. We're looking at, I don't know, five clean sparrows and swamp sparrow. So we're not looking at a lot of sparrows. We're looking at like a dozen, 13 sparrows as options. So example number one, and this is why I would love to be in a room with you because I need to know sort of how you're reacting to this sparrow. So I think we can all agree that this is a streaky sparrow, and I'm going to let some of you think about it. You know, our next step is to ask, is this a song sparrow? And when you see a sparrow, you should, a streaky sparrow, you should always be asking yourself, is it a song sparrow? And odds are the answer is going to be yes. Now, it would be so nice if... When we see a streaky sparrow, we had a song sparrow, like, that drifted in. But, you know, here we have. Here's a song sparrow. We know this is a song sparrow, and we can compare it to this sparrow. And you can immediately start to see some differences. I know of a lot of birders who would pass this bird off as a song sparrow because it's a streaky sparrow. It's got a lot of the same feather patterning patterning as this song sparrow, but it's streaky on the breast and down the sides all the way to the flanks. Its back is a mixture of brown and black. Even it's the side of its, below the auriculars and the side of its nape is grayish. It's got a grayish supercilium. It's got a pale mailer here. This looks a lot like a song sparrow. If you looked at it, in, you know, it's got, a, it's got the song sparrow's central spot. But, you know, I think you can all see that this bird is not a song sparrow. And many of you probably know this bird and know that when you see a streaky sparrow this time of year that's got this beautiful, buffy, creamish wash across its breast, you've got a Lincoln sparrow. And that's what this bird is. And I can tell you, I've been in the field with birders We've had this bird teed up and singing. And I've been in the field with birders who just never would have given this bird the time of day. They would have either passed it off as a song sparrow and moved on because, you know, heck, there are warblers to be seen, or they just didn't want to deal with it. 
Um, and I've been with birders who, when I show them that this is a Lincoln Sparrow and it is a spectacular bird, nesting most for the most part in our bogs, they there is like a light, this beautiful, this wonderful light bulb. There's enlightenment that happens. So, um, so yes, um, there is no other sparrow that has the fine, pert, streaky markings and creamy wash about its breast and sides and even up onto its face um, um, that, that, than a Lincoln sparrow. There are rarer sparrows that will have some creamy washing here, but this is a, this is a fairly common sparrow. To see it in the breeding season, you do need to be in bogs. I have also seen them breeding in scrubby fields. I've seen them breeding in, in cattail marshes also. But this is really a sparrow of our bogs. You will see it in migration, particularly in the fall when it's far more cosmopolitan in its habitat choices. But, you know, the markings on Lincoln Sparrow are really distinctly different from Song Sparrow. This bird has a really long tail. It's blotchier and much sort of messier and not as pinstriped in its in its streakings. And the, as you look at Song Sparrow and you just spend time looking at those heavy duty streaking on a Song Sparrow, it's heavier lateral throat stripe. It's heavier central spot. This will begin to jump out you, at you as something different. So Lincoln Sparrow is our first example. Our next example, you know, I'm probably rushing here, but I'm gonna make time for questions for all of you. Our next example, um, question, it's a streaky sparrow. Question, is it a song sparrow? This is the same species. Uh, we just happen to have a song sparrow here. And there are a couple things to notice here. There are some obvious things. This yellowish super laurel area. The other thing to note is that this bird has a relatively short tail. And you know, song sparrows have longish tails. It's something I have mentioned earlier when I was encouraging you to look at song sparrows. And then when you get to your homework, when you're looking at song sparrows and you are watching them flutter away from you into the thicket, watch their tails because song sparrows have a longish tail, even relatively longer than other members of its genus, Melospiza. Um, Lincoln Sparrow is a mellow spiza, and so is Swamp Sparrow. Song Sparrow, when it flops away from you, when it flutters away from you, its tail kind of flops a little. And it's, for me, diagnostic. I can watch a Song Sparrow just kind of flutter away from me into the shrubs, and I just see this little tail movement, and I say, oh, yeah, that's a Song Sparrow. Um, this sparrow has a distinctly shorter tail. It's also got kind of a more pert appearance to it. It still has similar facial patterns. This is unmistakable, although it is mistakable in the field. It can be barely, barely visible in the field. Um, other things, this bird tends to have pinkish, almost bubblegum colored legs. Song sparrows tend to have dingier, darker legs. This bird's Bill, do I have another one? Yeah, there's another one. This bird's bill tends to be paler. Song sparrow's bills are darkish. This looks kind of paler because it's probably kind of shiny in this photograph. But you can see a different posture. This is a different genus. This is just a different sparrow. And this is probably one of the most overlooked birds in Vermont. If you are at the edge of a meadow or a hayfield right now, these birds are on territory and singing. This is Savannah Sparrow. True to its name, it is a sparrow of open grasslands. Uh, even hay fields and meadows here in Vermont and across the, across the entire continent. Um, when it sings, it has a song somewhat reminiscent of song sparrow, but really insect-like and different. I hope you can hear this. There's its call note. So that is Savannah Sparrow. And, you know, um, we haven't talked a lot about behavior. I will talk about behavior now. Um, 
Savannah sparrows, when you spish them, and remember I said that sparrows are spishable. If you've got a sparrow walking around on the lawn or flittering in the edge of a meadow and you spish, Savannah sparrows love to jump up. And so what I did was I queried iNaturalist for Savannah sparrows. And I had page after page of Savannah sparrow images. Lots of them were on barbed wire because this is a bird that, you know, lives in meadows and hay fields, and birders tend to bird the edges of them. And Savannah sparrows will hop up and sing from barbed wire or fence posts. So behavior is a clue on this bird. Savannah sparrows are spishable, and they will spish up like waist height. They will pop up and sit in the open on a wire. Um, when I used to do birding trips to Berlin Pond, I'm sure some of you were there with me, we would make a side trip to the airport near Berlin Pond here in Berlin, Vermont. The EF Knapp State Airport is a small airport, and we would get to the runways to go look for like meadowlarks and um, you know, upland sandpipers and savanna sparrows. And I knew that I could spish, and a couple of savanna sparrows would hop up onto the cyclone fence and sit there for us. And on most of these, well, on most of them, you, it's hard to see the yellow supralaurel area. I don't see it on really many of these very well, and you probably don't see it well either. But no, short tail, pert markings, clean, sharper markings. This is a bird that varies across the continent for a number of reasons, um, which I won't go into. But know that behavior is a field mark here. Savannah sparrows are spishable. They'll, they'll jump into the top of a shrub and sit there and let you look at them. Probably longer than a song, certainly longer than a song sparrow will. Another example. Now, if you know song sparrow and you've been sort of noticing these sparrows I've been showing you, this thing just looks a little weird. It looks a little odd. Like you could probably tell that this isn't a song sparrow. First of all, we look at song sparrows and we know that there's no song sparrow I've ever seen that has a rusty shoulder patch like this. These are lesser wing coverts. They are rusty. This is a really rare mark and is often hidden on these birds. It's a relatively rare field mark. As it turns out, red-winged blackbirds have these. This is where the red on a red-winged blackbird is. But this is a sparrow. It's got a pale bill. It's got really, again, pinstripe markings. It's also got, it's hard to see it here, and I wish I, you, I, I kind of knew how, whether you could see this. It's got a, some weirdness right here and here. This, this bird has an eye ring. So, and it, here's again, this sort of U-shaped area on the auriculars. That is unusual. It's not as easy to see here. But if you look at a lot of song sparrows and you see this sparrow, you're going to say to yourself, hey, that is no song sparrow. Its bill is pale. This eye ring business is odd. This U-shaped base bottom to the auriculars. This chestnut patch. That is no song sparrow. Here it is again. This is probably the best look you'll ever get at this bird. Again, I have lots of pictures of this. It often doesn't show that. This bird has white outer tail feathers that we're not seeing here. But again, it's got a weird face. And if you look at enough song sparrows, this will jump out as you, at you as being weird. It's not something we normally see because we don't normally see this bird. This bird, as some of you know, is a Vesper sparrow. And it is a, again, it's our final example of streaky sparrows. And it's just weird. It looks different. Here it is compared to a song sparrow. Again, here's that odd you thing that is usually more pronounced. It's basically made by this pale center to the auriculars, whereas song sparrows auriculars tend to be more uniform. And song sparrows auriculars don't tend to have this, this half of the U showing. So this is Vesper Sparrow. I just see it. I see it. I see these birds and I see the weird face. And I say, ah, oh, that's a Vesper Sparrow. They tend to, I see them as a little bit more slender than song sparrows. Um, there's one other thing about Vesper Sparrow. And again, I don't necessarily want you to 
remember this about Vesper Sparrow, although it's certainly a memorable uh, characteristic of Vesper Sparrow. I just want you to know that there are many ways to look at and identify sparrows. And that if you look at this is a this is these are screenshots from a Google search of Vesper Sparrow images. And one of the unusual things about this is that these are all indeed Vesper Sparrows. If you Google Vesper Sparrow, you will find incorrect results in Google image searches of Vesper Sparrows. You probably find some song sparrows in there. But look at this. Here is that weird auricular base. You can get a sense of the eye ring. Notice we're not seeing chestnut patches, maybe a little bit there. But there's another odd thing about this. Yes, this is a grassland bird. Here it is on barbed wire. But notice these two pictures here. And I hope you can see my cursor. This bird is above the photographer. This bird is above the photographer. This is the same bird. Here's another screenshot of Google image returns. A grassland bird, obviously, scrubby, open areas. This bird is backlit against the sky. So is this one. This bird is high in a tree. Sparrows do not normally spish up into trees. So like you're out at the edge of a field and there's a wire, a telephone wire or a tree and you see some sparrows on the ground, you will try to identify them first on the ground. You'll see this weird face. You'll say, oh wow, I think that's a Vesper sparrow. You can again see this weirdness on this auricular here. But if that sparrow jumps up into a tree, you got to think Vesper sparrow because Vesper sparrows will flush high into trees. It's one of their marks. It's a field mark. And this is indeed a grassland nesting bird. It's not common um, across Vermont. It is in scattered locations, but it's mostly a bird of the Champlain lowlands and um, probably the Connecticut River Valley as well. But again, a grassland species, if there are trees, they like it when there are trees nearby. And to be safe, they will flush up into a tree and look at you and sit there. So Vesper Sparrow. So those are examples of street sparrows and how we might look at them. Um, let's look at a few clean sparrows. Generally speaking, these are easier IDs. Clean sparrows are more distinctly marked. There's not a lot of this sort of messiness to, you know, daunt us or cause confusion. This messiness, the more you look at song sparrows and the more you learn these feather groupings, it's really going to start to make sense to you. You're going to see patterns. Clean sparrows, well, they're clean. And they are more recognizable, just as recognizable as warblers are. This was our in-betweener. This is a swamp sparrow, okay? This is really, I consider it a clean sparrow. They can look dingy. But this bird just begins with this lovely warmth, this warm corduroy gray, warmth on the head, grayish, a grayish supercilium, grayish clean auriculars against this gray nape, just sort of this soft, wonderful mixture of gray and brown. And... I photographed this bird at Berlin Pond. It hopped up onto a twig, but it's mostly hanging out in cattail marshes. And, oh, I should say, and we will talk about habitat in a bit, um, swamp sparrow, and I'm rushing, so I may have called it something else, but swamp sparrow has a trill that I don't have for you now, but it has a trill that sounds like, for example, a chipping sparrow which also has a rusty crown, by the way, or even a pine warbler, or even a junco. It's a rolled trill, a sharp sewing machine trill. But you're not going to see a chipping sparrow in a wetland, nor will you see a pine warbler in a wetland, nor will you see a junco in a wetland. Swamp sparrows are indeed actually sparrows more so of marshes, cattail marshes. So you hear a trill out in a cattail marsh, you see a little brown bird pop up and sing, you got a swamp sparrow, and it's a clean sparrow. So again, song and habitat come into play. Very much so, and we're going we're gonna to get to that in a bit more. 
So other, here are our other clean sparrows. This one, many of you probably have not seen. This is a sparrow that, um, I actually photographed this in the West. It is a common sparrow in the West, but it's also a common Northern breeding sparrow that in the last 20 years ago, 20 years or so has started to move south in its breeding distribution. I found this bird while I was working for the city of South Burlington doing a bird survey in scrubby habitat in South Burlington. We hadn't really known it to be a breeder in Vermont and it breeds in scattered locations around Vermont. This is clay colored sparrow. And generally I don't bump into it in migration unless I'm in its breeding habitat, which is shrubby open lands, scrubby open lands has a distinctive song, and it is a diagnostic bird with its relatively clean markings and clearly, you know, defined face pattern. Um, so to find that bird, you're going to probably want to find it on its breeding grounds. They sit up and sing on the tops of shrubby, you know, shrubs, not in trees, you know, in shrubby overgrown fields. Here's a bird that many of you will know. It's a cosmopolitan sparrow. It's in the same genus as clay-colored sparrow. This is chipping sparrow. And it's known for its rusty cap, its black eye line, its trilled song. And these two birds are related. This is clay-colored sparrow. This is chipping sparrow. And you say, oh, you know, I got no problem there. These are, these are great examples of clean sparrows. They are identifiable sparrows. I see field marks here and I can deal with these. You know, they're not messy, streaky sparrows. The problem with these sparrows, and I'm going to just touch on other plumages a bit here before we wind down. The problem is that in the fall, these sparrows look alike. This is chipping sparrow adult. This is clay colored sparrow adult. This is a young or an, this is a winter this is an immature chipping sparrow, and this is an immature clay-colored sparrow. This I photographed in the winter in New Mexico. This is an, someone else's photo. Um, these two birds pose one of the classic sort of dastardly duos, some people call them, the classic fall sparrow identification challenges. They may look separable here on screen, Trust me, in the field, their, their identification is a challenge. But remember what I said about head and face markings. This bird, by the way, we can't see it, is an unstreaked sparrow, even as a young bird. As a juvenile, it's not. But as a winter or a fall bird, it is. Um, there are differences in these sparrows' head markings. You will probably, you've, some of you probably noticed them already. Classically, when you see these sparrows in fall, you look at the lures. Chipping sparrow has a black, its black eye line continues all the way to the bill. Clay-colored sparrow has clean lures. They are often not this clean. <laughs> um, sometimes they're a little messy, but that is a different field mark, and it is a known field mark. Also, look at the lateral throat stripe. It is ill-defined on chipping sparrow, and it is well-defined, often more defined than this on clay-colored sparrow. That is a legitimate field mark, a damn good field mark in the field. So good that, in fact, the – and again, it's not showing well in this particular – uh, image so good that the intensity of that lateral throat stripe is often equal to the intensity of this mustachial strike or this lower strike on the stripe on the auriculars. You just don't see that definition on a um, on a winter chipping sparrow. You do see it on clay colored sparrow. As a result, the mailer. The white clean, it looks cleaner and more prominent on a clay-colored sparrow than it does on a chippy. So that's why it's good to know the positioning of those feather markings to be able to know their parlance and know how to look at them.
This is a classic fall challenge. It's not something you're going to deal with now because these sparrows are recognizable now. You can actually see some of the, re the remnants of it. I've lost my cursor. You can see some of the remnants of it on the breeding plumage birds. And you can, but you can really see it and use it in the fall. Um, so those are three examples of sparrows. And just, again, I don't necessarily want you to memorize those markings, but just get a sense of how we look at sparrows. But there is another way that some people like to look at sparrows, and that is what is sometimes called the generic approach. And um, most of you can probably tell that these are nothing like the sparrows that we've seen. First of all, they've got just these lovely chestnut and black upper sides. They are, this one is, this one, I can't see my cursor, I've lost it. The one on the right is streaky. The one on the left is fairly clean, even though you can't see it below. But there's something that's so different about these sparrows in these lovely photos. And that is, look at the bill and the forehead. Look at the sloping forehead. These things have like, you know, Roman noses. The forehead slopes straight to the bill. And that is a characteristic of this genus of sparrow. And this on the left is a grasshopper sparrow, and on the right is a Henslow sparrow. They're both members of the genus Amodromus or Amodramus. They are, this is a distinct characteristic of this genus. And some folks will tell you, you know, learn sparrow genera. Learn what makes an amadromous sparrow an amadromous sparrow and a mellospiza sparrow a mellospiza sparrow. Yeah, you know, it's good to know that stuff, but I'm going to suggest you can learn it. But I like the streaky versus clean and the habitat versus and seasonal approach to identifying these sparrows. Limit your options. Know what's around you. Learn what's common. And then go looking for the rare stuff like these. Our bird on the left, grasshopper sparrow, will nest in scattered locations here in Vermont. It's a fairly, relatively rare breeder. And you'll just, this is the trip that you're going to go take to go find yourself a grasshopper sparrow. Henslow sparrows used to nest here. They're gone. They're extirpated. It's a grassland sparrow that I believe has been declining. That's a Henslow, that's a, that is a Henslow sparrow. Look at the weird face on this thing. Um, the auriculars are very odd on this Henslow sparrow on the right. And this weird puke green or a pea soup color to its face is really unusual. And just, you got to love this chestnut and black on its back. And look at that sloping forehead. So, again, you're not going to find this sparrow breeding in Vermont. It's here rare sightings. I can't remember the last time I've seen this bird in Vermont. Probably 30 years ago. Um, you will find them much more common in the plains or wintering in the south. This one, for example, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with this sparrow? It's an unmarked clean sparrow, and I'm just not seeing much on it. This is not a sparrow we will see in Vermont, so you can rest easy and take a deep breath. Most of you, in fact, will not be seeing this sparrow. That's because this is a Bachman sparrow. It is exceedingly uh, rare. Um, it is a sparrow of the – it's not so rare in the southeast – it is a sparrow of pine savanna. It is a habit. It's it is a specialist in open pine savanna woodlands. These are longleaf pines, and my friend Josh, we went there to find Bachman sparrow and a few other things. So, like you know, you want to find a Bachman sparrow, you go to where Bachman sparrows are, and it's you know you might find Bachman sparrow in your field guide. You're not going to find it in Vermont, and I don't want you to worry about it. And frankly, you're not going to worry that much about grasshopper sparrow because you're not going to bump into it in migration that much. So what else do we see in these pine woodlands? Like really good things, like red cockaded woodpeckers. So some sparrows are habitat specialists. And, you know, you almost don't need to learn its field marks. You just go to where Bachman sparrows hang out, and you're going to hear this distinctive song, and you're going to say, yeah, that's a Bachman sparrow, and you can then spend time with and learn it but you almost don't even need to look at it. You're going to see this characteristic sparrow of pine savanna, and you'll know you got a Bachman sparrow. So we're going to wind down here. And um, how am I doing on time? I'm over on time. So, but we are almost done. 
And so what I want you to do, and I will make this slide, this coming slide, available to you uh, for downloading. And rather than the generic approach, rather than learning what makes a mellospies a sparrow, a mellospies or an am a modromus sparrow and a modromus, I will try to compartmentalize uh, sparrows for you. And we will begin by common breeding, with common breeding sparrows. So like now, for example, if you're out and about birding, there are essentially five sparrows that you need to think about. Uh, two of them are streaked, two of them are clean, and one is for the most part clean, swamp sparrow. I can't see my cursor, I'm afraid, so I can't point. But um, most sparrows that many of you encounter will be one of these five. Chipping sparrow, white-throated sparrow, they are easily identifiable. Song sparrow and savanna sparrow are an identification challenge, and I want you to spend time looking at both of them. Not simply to distinguish them now, but to distinguish them when you're out birding and you see some streaky sparrow out of context, and you're going to know it's a savanna sparrow or a song sparrow. So more uncommon or rare breeders that you're less apt to see in migration, and I know some of you are saying, wait a minute, a field sparrow, I'm seeing them in migration all the time. Well, I live in Montpelier, Vermont. Here in the Eastern Piedmont, we don't see that sparrow a lot. Uh, in the Champlain Lowlands and in other locations, lower areas of Vermont, you're gonna see field sparrow more often. It's a clean sparrow, you know? I don't see Lincoln sparrows. I don't see, I see them every spring in migration, but not far from there, usually uh, later in May when they're on breeding grounds. Vesper sparrow, again, a specialized sparrow of scattered grasslands around Vermont. So, like, these are uncommon or rare breeders. These are not sparrows you're going to bump into routinely. You're going to bump into the sparrows on the upper left portion of this screen more often. Then, other sparrows in Vermont, we have common migrating sparrows that don't breed here. They frankly don't spend much time in the winter here either. We tend to see them only as migrants. Fox sparrows generally in April and throughout the fall, probably when, October in the fall. Uh, white crown sparrows are going to be coming through now and into Maine, then they're gone. Not a bird you're going to be thinking about much during the breeding season. So that's another compartmentalized way to look at sparrows. Then we've got these winter residents. Um, American tree sparrow, similar which to chipping sparrow, except that it's got this um, central breast spot. It's only here as a winter quote unquote resident. Then it leaves us. Lapland long spur used to be a sparrow. It's a nasp, not a sparrow, but it's a sparrow look like look alike. It used to be in the same family as sparrows. It no longer is, I believe. And um, it is a winter bird here. And we go to find them in the Champlain Lowlands. They like the open plains of the Champlain Valley in winter. It reminds them a lot of their Arctic breeding grounds. So those are winter residents, a not something we're going to deal with now. And then there are these crazy rare stuff that has been, these three species have been seen in Vermont. And... Um, I guess Nelson Sparrow is showing up as a fall migrant somewhat regularly. But again, not birds that you're going to worry about now. If you are new to sparrows, you're going to be thinking about those common breeders on the upper left side of this slide. And um, we'll make this available and maybe some other resources that I'll prepare for you that we'll be able to download probably in a day or so from the website, the North Branch website. Um, so we'll recap. We'll wrap it up. Um, I want you to spend time with these sparrows and just, you know, be your good birding self. Be stealthy, subtle, and be patient. As you spish these sparrows, it's going to, you're going to need to spend some time with them and look at them. You know, watching sparrows through binoculars is not often that easy. Seeing the lures on a sparrow that's moving around in the grass is not as easy as it was looking at pictures here. Spish. Spish a lot. Sparrows respond. Some really, really well. Do it responsibly, particularly during the breeding season. Don't push these birds. You know, 
No Song Sparrow. Like, it all begins with Song Sparrow. Their behavior matters. A Song Sparrow, you know, look for its floppy tail as it flies away from you and hides. Note that a Savannah Sparrow, this is a Savannah Sparrow, note that it's going to sit for you on a fence post or barbed wire. Remember that Vesper Sparrows might jump up into a tree. Consider season and habitat. You got a little brown bird out in a marsh? Well, if it's not a marsh wren, you know, probably a few other things, you know, it's a swamp sparrow. And, again, consider seasons. Narrow down your choices by season. And if you're really hot to find other sparrows, many of them you will not encounter in migration. Many of them you will go seek on your own. Like, you know, like grasshopper sparrow. I just don't see it. I got to go to places where I know it breeds. So use eBird or iNaturalist and find these birds. Find grasshopper sparrow if you want to learn grasshopper sparrow. Because I can guarantee you, if you're out birding somewhere else, like where have I bumped into grass? You know, I've bumped into grasshopper sparrows when I'm birding in the fall uh, in Maine, for example. Um, so on the coast, I've seen grasshopper sparrows in November in Maine on the coast where I spent a fair amount of time. So um, learn them in the field here, seek them out. So that is basically it. Um, we can end with um, something profound about sparrows. A lot of people don't know that um, Confucius said, I was complaining because I had no Swarovskis. Then I met a man who had no sparrows. Well, actually... Like, we know he didn't say that. Okay, Confucius didn't say that. What he said was, I was complaining because I had no Swarovskis. Then I met a man who had no sense of song sparrow or feather head morphology. So there I will leave you with that.